thank you very much for coming. Um, welcome to you all. I am not Matthew Hotter. <laughs> really sorry about that. He's vaguely entertaining. Um, unfortunately, and I will explain exactly who Matthew Hossoff is in a moment, and, um, but I'm going to start by explaining that he has been called away and he may pop in later. But Matthew Hotoff is Vice Dean for Research at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, and from now on I'm calling it the IOPPN. And um, uh, he is fundamentally in charge of all PhD students as well as research um, everywhere else in the Institute. He was really hoping to come and welcome you all, uh, but unfortunately can't. But he may pop in, in which case we may take a brief break so he can say a few words. But for the moment, you are stuck with me. Um, so I am Sarah Byford. I am a professor in the Health Service and Population Research Department, and uh, I am also the Associate Dean for Doctoral Studies, which basically means that I am the academic lead for all of you PhD students at the IOPPN. Um, and I work with a wonderful team who you will already have had emails with and maybe met a few of them today. We have. Um, one in each corner and some outside. Um, I will. Um, I have a slide with all of their names on, so I will introduce them in a little while. Um, what are we going to do today? So um, I am going to very, very briefly introduce you to the institute. Uh, if you have been here before, anybody been here before? Work here? Already know the place? That's probably at least half of you. So you can just kind of doze off for that small section, but for those of you where this is your first time at the IOPPN or Kings more broadly, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the Institute. I'm then going to tell you how we manage your PhD um, and how we support you throughout the next few years. Now for a lot of you that will be three years, but we'll have part-timers who might be here for six. Um, we'll also have people who interrupt, um, often for lots of weird and wonderful reasons. So you may end up being with us for quite some time, but um, my aim is to try and get you through it as quickly as possible and as painlessly as possible. Now, you will have heard stories about how difficult PhDs are. I'm not gonna deny they are, um, but they can also be amazing experiences. And uh, for me, coming out at the end of it as a completely different person fundamentally, I hope you all feel the same. Um, so, all I can say is, yes, it gets difficult, um, but uh, it's all worth the pain in the end. So, I'm going to describe some of the things that you need to do in your first few weeks, and then um, talk about the, uh, the support that's available for you um, at the university and the institute, should you need it. You then get the pleasure of listening to other people who are um, going to talk about Things like supervisory relationships, so um, we have um, Suki Shergill is this year's IOPPN Supervisory Excellence Award winner and he's going to come and talk to you about relationships with your supervisor. I'll probably throw a bit in about that myself at times as well. Um, we have, uh, let me get my list, we have Caroline Vance who is um, our personal tutor coordinator for the IOPPN. He's going to talk to you about the personal tutor scheme we have here so that there's independent people you can go and talk to should you need to. Um, we've got Kate Murray coming to talk to you about careers and employability. Um, Amy Moore who's going to talk about doctoral student development um, and uh, then we have Rebecca Custerton. Um, women of the Wall, interesting one. We've never had Women of the Wall talk here before. Um, but I'm really pleased she's going to be able to, although, so for anybody who doesn't know, the wall is a building, a neuroscience building over on the King's College Hospital site, um, and it's uh, very sciencey and lab-based, and um, Rebecca, uh, I believe, started this little group called Women of the Wall, uh, which is to um, bring together, fundamentally, women who work in sciences, but it's expanded hugely and now cuts across the whole of the Institute. Um, we've then got some, some representatives from the KCL Student Union and the Denmark Hill Postgraduate Research Students Association. Um, hopefully you can stay with us after that. We will have a drinks reception upstairs in the canteen on the second floor. 
Um, unusually, we order um, food from the King's Caterers that's actually quite good. You'll know, for those of you who've been here before, that catering here is not brilliant. So we have got hamburgers, we've got the most amazing cupcakes in, in the world, as well as alcohol. So please do stay with us, um, meet each other, talk to me, talk to anybody who, who comes um, along and just start to um, get to know people. So, I am going to kick us off with, with what is a little bit of a sense of the structure of the Institute. It is marginally out of date because you'll notice Matthew Hortoff is not there. It is partly because this is uneditable, which means that I'd have to start from scratch and I'm sorry. That's just too much time. So, for those of you that, that don't know, the Institute is run by Ian Eberle. He is our Dean and the other important people in the Institute that you may or may not come across would be Matthew Hotoff, who's the Vice Dean for Research, Patrick Lehman, who is the Dean for Education. Um, I report directly to Matthew, but I also work very closely with Patrick um, in, in kind of relation to quality assurance for students, etc. Um, we then have our three divisions. Um, first is neuroscience, um, then we have uh, psychology and system sciences as well as psychiatry in the middle. Now each of you will be attached to one department within one of these divisions, hopefully you know which one. Um, but just to give me a sense, how many have we got from neuroscience? That's always a big one. Neuroimaging? A few of you. Uh, Dev Neuro, MRC. Centre for Developmental Neurobiology. Fabulous. So we have two groups, as you will know, but not everybody, um, that are actually based over at Guys, which is Dev Neuro and Watson Card. So we've got anybody from Watson Card? Yeah, hi, welcome. And then Psychiatry, Addictions. Yay, hi. Um, child and Adolescent. Yeah, just the one. Um, fans, Forensic and Neurodevelopmental. Brilliant. Uh, old Age. Hi, welcome. That's quite a few. Old age is a really small department. Brilliant. Psychology <laughs> medicine, great. You are the second biggest group we have, neuroscience being the largest. Um, psychosis, gosh, quite a lot there as well. And then finally, in the last division, biostats and what's now health informatics. Anybody? Nope. Uh, HSPR, my department. Yep, yeah, hi, welcome. Um, you have the fabulous advantage of having me in your building, so if things go horribly wrong, you know where I am. Um, psychology. Hi, everybody. And finally, the SGDP. Brilliant. So we've got representatives from every department, apart from Biostats and Health Informatics, who are also quite a small group. Um, so that is how we are structured. Um, and this is how you are effectively managed. So I don't like the term, I'm not managing you, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but this is the structure around you um, and how it works. So you should have at least two supervisors, a first and a second supervisor usually, although some of you may have co-first supervisors, particularly if you're MRC DTP funded. Um, you effectively report to what's known as a Departmental Doctoral <coughs> Studies Subcommittee. Now these are committees that um, monitor you throughout your time here, um, are there to help you if you need anything, and um, for the majority of the departments you have your own subcommittee, but some of the smaller departments are joined together, and I'll show you a list in a moment. So their job is to monitor you every four months, um, this will involve you filling out a progress report um, that's submitted online. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And um, they uh, meet once every four months and they just check that progress is going as it should um, in order to try and spot anybody that is struggling a bit and can do with some extra help. They also manage the process of upgrades. So I, I know. Um, this will all become obvious to you, but some of you may not quite got your head around the whole MPhil slash PhD. At King's you are all initially registered as an MPhil, um, and then you are all required to go through what's called an upgrade process where you upgrade from MPhil to PhD. Again, I will talk a little bit more about that later, but fundamentally it's just a slightly um, longer, more detailed uh, proposal of your research and um, you have a 
mini viva um, where two academics are able to just check that you're on track, that your PhD is feasible and pick up on it, any any problems that might need resolving before you um, finish the PhD. Um, they also manage your exam entry process, um, but that's much later on, uh, so I wouldn't worry about that just now. They are supported by my education support team. I call it mine, I'm sorry, it's everybody's, but it just feels like they're mine. And, um, those subcommittees report to the IOPPN Doctoral Studies Committee, which I chair, um, and that committee, um, as with all of our committees, has student representation, um, as well as a lot of people outside of um, the departments who support you in various ways, be it through personal tutoring or admissions or stuff like that. So we, that committee also meets three times a year. Um, and then finally, that committee, i.e. me, reports to the King's Committee, which is called the King's Postgraduate Research Student Subcommittee. So this is where I can take anything that's been raised um, by you or by our supervisors uh, up to the King's level, um, and uh, they will feed back down to us as well. Now they are based in what's called the King's Centre for Doctoral Studies. So Amy Moore, who's coming to talk to you in a little while, is from the Centre for Doctoral Studies. Um, this is a King's level group that is here to support um, the development of researchers, including postgraduate research students. Um, so they do focus on um, research staff as well, um, but half of them focus on um, you guys alone, really. And they provide all kinds of training um, opportunities and um, support, which you'll hear more about later. So each of your doctoral studies subcommittees um, is made up of a chair and a deputy chair, and I have a few photographs, so you can try and spot yours in a moment. Um, they have a number of academics who help to um, review your progress and, and are there to help if necessary and they also have student reps. Um, if anybody is interested in being a student rep, do let us know, um, because we're, we're always keen to get more if we can. Their role is to do a number of things. The first one will already have happened, which is they approve the research projects um, that you will all have submitted or been involved with um, in your ad um, admission. Um, they're there to ensure that you have the facilities you need, uh, to uh, consider the student experience, respond to any feedback. For PhD and MD students, there is a national um, PRES uh, postgraduate research experience survey every two years, so please do fill that in um, when it comes around. Um, we've just finished one, so it'll be in two years' time. Um, because, believe me, we do try and respond uh, to the best of our ability to the feedback we get. They also monitor you, as I've said, and they approve your upgrades. Um, so this is a list of the committees. You can see some of them are combined. Um, so the second one, BCM, Basic and Clinical Neuroscience, is combined with neuroimaging and is our largest subcommittee. Um, child and Adolescent and FANS, Forensic and Neurodevelopmental, are combined. Um, SGDP and Biostats, etc. So um, see if you can spot yours there. We have had a, as is often the case at the end of an academic year, we've had a couple of people who have stepped down and we are in the process of replacing um, those chairs. And actually just uh, for anybody in Walton Card right at the bottom, Nikki um, is here at the moment but she will be off on maternity leave so she will also be replaced briefly. Um, so these are the ones that I can tell you about. We have two that still need to be confirmed. Ian Campbell, I'm sorry, but there's no photograph that exists of him anywhere on the planet. So uh, you're just going to have to figure, psych men are just going to have to figure that out for themselves when they get back. Um, but these are your subcommittee chairs, and they are here to help. They are not here to beat you around the head and say, why aren't you working harder? They're here to just make sure that things are going okay, that you're happy, um, and they're there to help solve any problems should you need it. So this is um, our team. We have Lisa is the manager. She's standing at the back. Um, Verena, Eve, and Olivia. So Olivia is here, and she's going to sit here and just check 
and make sure that we all keep time, hopefully, and um, be here just in case something goes horribly wrong with the technology. Um, and then Verena and was outside when you registered, and Eve is running around doing a million different things. Um, she organised this whole um, event. Uh, the, the whole of EST, again, are there if you need them. There is, um, there's a number of things that they do, which I've listed, um, but they're also the kind of group that, if you just don't know who to ask, then you can always ask them. So what they focus on primarily is ensuring that um, we follow Kingsley's regulations and their policies and procedures. They will support you with issues around tuition fees and funding, um, queries on registration and ID card problems. Um, they, uh, they administratively manage the upgrade process, so they'll be in touch with you about that a bit nearer the time. Um, they also manage all of the online progress reports um, and they will constantly remind you of important deadlines and I'm not kidding you but you need to learn to actually read their emails because, um, because everything important comes from them. Um, so uh, do check your email. There is, um, particularly if you have been here before or are a staff member and already have a staff account, Please make sure that you somehow access your student account because all of the communication you'll get from the education support team will be to the new student account. Okay, so I believe, although things have changed recently, um, I believe you can still forward emails from an internal account to an internal account. What I think you can no longer do is um, automatically forward emails. Um, to an external account. So if you're all you know, using a Gmail account or something like that, please make sure that you also check your student account um, every now and then. Um, EST can also help you with any issues around research passports, DBS checks, etc. Um, and like I said, they're just generally there to signpost you, so if you really don't know who to go and see, um, they're a good place to start. So let's talk about your degree. Um, this is a timeline of your degree starting down here. You are here in your first month and there are a number of things that you need to do in the first month um, that are listed here and I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So there's an initial target setting form which is effectively your, your it's the baseline for your future progress monitoring forms where you will say whether or not you've achieved your targets. Um, there is a guidance for supervision form, which is a document that you and your supervisors need to go through, and again, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and uh, a couple of other things that are on a subsequent slide. From this point on, every four months you have to fill in a progress monitoring report. Um, and then at the nine month point, or 18 months if you are part time, that's when you need to submit documentation for your upgrade. Um, and once you're through that upgrade, um, you are fundamentally left alone, apart from the four month monitoring report. Until you get to around about six months before submission, um, then you need to be thinking about submitting forms to nominate, for example, your examiners. Um, these are the key milestones that we will keep track of and that the education support team will, like I said, email you about constantly. So let's just talk a little bit about the progress reports. Now, I did my PhD at King's, so I know how tedious they, they are. If it's any help, I had to do them every three months, you only have to do them every four months. Um, and so things have got a little bit better. And this is kind of a plea because as somebody who knows how tedious they are, and in my day it was on paper um, rather than online, so at least you get that as a bonus. Um, but um, it wasn't really until I was sitting on this side of the fence that I started to recognise why they were important. I just saw them as a minor irritation in my life. Um, but they are important. If you're doing well and everything's going smoothly, fantastic, all you have to do is very briefly say so. And, and nothing, nothing will happen, um, so it's not too time consuming. But obviously if you are having problems, and, and problems can be many and varied, for some people um, 
you know, the common types of problems for PhD students is often around recruitment if you're involved in a trial. Um, things never quite go to plan when you're doing research. So it, it could be um, imaging equipment, you know, shut down of machinery for three months that's meant you haven't been able to do whatever it was. You could have a disaster in your lab if you're working um, in, a, in a lab. Um, with, I don't know, maybe the death of the zebra fish. I'm afraid I'm not a lab host person. Um, but I did once interview a lot of students who liked zebra fish, so I learned quite a lot. I never thought I'd ever know. Um, so there, commonly there are research type issues, and, and those monitoring reports are the point where, you know, we can look at it and go, okay, this is an issue. Yes, you've made some suggestions with your supervisor on how to resolve this, but maybe we can get involved and help. Um, you may find that, that your problems are with your supervisors. Um, all I can say is that uh, relationships between student and supervisors are just like any relationship. Um, I'm not trying to tell you that we have bad supervisors or bad students, but sometimes students and supervisors don't get on. It is just human nature when you spend that much time in a relationship with somebody, um, quite a close relationship, sometimes closer than you would like if you're meeting with them constantly. Um, sometimes things do go wrong, and this is, is one of those areas where um, there are a lot of people that um, you can talk it through with, and there are a lot of solutions that you may not have thought about. I have dealt with so many difficult supervisor-student relationships that I have options up my sleeve that, that you may not in the moment even have considered. So I would put in a strong plea, if things are starting to go horribly wrong, Please talk to somebody. That could be me, it could be a personal tutor, it could be your other supervisor, it could be the chair of your subcommittee. But believe me, the sooner you start talking it through and thinking of possible solutions the quicker, we can get you back on track. Okay? Um, there'll be more about this later. I don't want to give you all a terrible impression. It's a tiny handful of you who may struggle with supervisors. But just to say that I was speaking to a student only a few weeks ago, who said he was having problems with her supervisor, who told me that she remembered me saying this at her induction. And she and her and um, somebody else who was with her turned to each other and said, oh, I'm so glad I've got the supervisor I've got. And she never thought she would end up talking to me about some difficulties that they were having. Um, like I said, it's human nature. So, um, the way the monitoring report works, sorry I digress very slightly, um, you fill it in online, you will get an email about a month before it, the closing date, and the reason why you get so long is because there's a few steps involved. So you will fill out the monitoring report, um, you will put in your targets for the next period, you will say how well you have achieved the previous period's targets, you will outline any obstacles um, and, and all of that kind of stuff. Once you submit it, it then goes to your supervisor. And your supervisor is asked to fill in a section confirming that things are going as you've described, um, outlining any issues from their point of view. Um, it then goes back to you just to check you're happy with it. And then the second time you submit it, it will be submitted to your subcommittee. Your subcommittee will then review your monitoring report. You will all be allocated a reviewer who um, will check your monitoring report when it's submitted, and then the subcommittee meet. And fundamentally, if you're doing fine, it'll just be yes, fine, 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 fine. Um, and, but they are there to try and pick out the ones that are not quite so fine. Um, so, like I said, you get a month. Try and fill it in in the first couple of weeks, because supervisors, particularly if your supervisor is incredibly senior and incredibly important, um, struggle to get anything done quickly. So we like to try and allow them a week or two at least, um, because if they've flown over to Australia um, or something like that, then, then they need a little bit of time to kind of get back to you. Okay? One thing I'd like you to bear in mind is to try and keep your targets smart. And if you don't know what this is, there's a little list here. Um, so specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and, and time-bound. Um, all of this will be available on the website, um, so we will let you all know um, 
probably provide you with a copy. But as you can see, for the first time ever, we are recording this. This is partly so that you can refer back to it if there's something I've said or if there was something on the slides um, that you didn't manage to write down or you've completely forgotten. But it's also um, for those of our new students who haven't been able to attend. So um, it will be there. Uh, I'm just conscious that, that there are people taking photos, but you will have access to this, I assure you. Now, why do we want your targets to be smart? Well, um, imagine the frustration if every student who is doing a systematic review, which many of you will do, um, their target is to continue with my systematic review. It's like, really? How am I supposed to assess whether or not you have continued with your systematic review? You could have spent 10 minutes on it and achieved that target. So what we'd really like is for you to be a lot more specific um, so something like to review the next 200 abstracts, okay? Just be very clear, and if, um, if you're not, you'll probably get an email from the subcommittee saying, can you please be a bit clearer on your targets so that we can assess it. Um, so do bear that in mind when you come to doing your reports. So, what do you need to do over the next few weeks while you're here? You're at the induction. Did anybody go to the King's induction? <laughs> ah, um, for the first time ever I didn't make it. Can you imagine, I actually go to these things, uh, so King's Induction is carried out twice a year, this one is done three times a year, and I go to all of them, it's killing me. Uh, this was the first um, time I didn't go to the King's Induction, um, it, it's huge, I mean you can see how many we have here, if you go to the King's Induction, it's one of those giant lecture theatres completely full. It gives you a really um, good sense of actually how big the community you're in is. Um, and of course, we would all love you to get together a bit more often. Um, so do keep an eye out for the, for the King's level PhD events, not just the Institute ones because although it might not feel like it, our campus isn't that far away from the other campuses. So, um, you will need to, if you haven't already, meet with your supervisors and uh, set targets for the next four months, which goes into your initial target setting form, um, which if you don't have it, the education support team will be sending to you shortly. Um, you are strongly encouraged to think about your um, training and development needs, um, to think about what support you need um, and uh, I don't just mean the training that you need for your um, to do your research so a lot of you will want statistics training systematic review training lab technique type training I want you to think bigger than that and again the Amy from the Centre for Doctoral Studies will talk a little bit more about this you are entitled to a minimum of 10 days a year as a full-time student, five as a part-time student, of what we call transferable skills training. This is training that is not necessarily directly related to your PhD, but it is going to help you in your future career. Now I know three years, six years for some of you feels like a long time, it's not, and um, we would love you to start thinking about the next steps right now. So think about whilst you've got the time here and you have so much training, seminars, workshops, etc. Um, available to you, um, think about making the most of it and do something that's good for you, not necessarily good for the PhD. If it's good for both, great. Um, but just think about yourself and what happens after you've finished. Um, you will need to complete an off-campus form if you are planning to disappear overseas anytime soon. Who's going to work abroad? Yep, a few of you. Um, we have quite a few, uh, particularly in my department, who work overseas because we have a global mental health group. And so a lot of their students come here for a few months and then go back home or to a completely different country to collect their data. Um, so those people will need to complete an off-campus form. And then you should also be thinking about having discussions about intellectual property. This is not something I'm particularly expert in um, because I'm an economist. I don't really create very much that I would um, need to worry about intellectual property. 
Um, but for some of you, this could be critical, um, and you need to sort out ownership of intellectual property at some point during your PhD. So if you think that's going to be relevant to you, for example, if you're developing an app or an outcome measure or something that um, is effectively saleable, um, then do think about that as well. Um, for, again, for those of you who know Kings and have been here, you will know that we have one of the worst websites on the planet ever. <laughs> However, there is a huge project going on at the moment that is upgrading, updating, oh, I don't know what exactly they're doing, it looks better. Uh, we are yet to know if functionally it's any better than the old system. Um, but because of that, we have um, a couple of web addresses that you should save. If you try and Google something about your PhD, I swear to God it could take you two hours to find what you're looking for. So, this is the IMPPN internal web pages for PTR students. Um, it has everything, hopefully, that you could possibly want in one place. Um, the other one that is probably worth checking out, this is completely new and I'm not particularly familiar with it myself, but there is a new website called Self Service, um, which is a bit odd, it sounds like a canteen website, but actually it is a kind of one-stop one shop for students at King's and it has one of those wonderful type in a question and, and hope for the best that an answer comes out. I've had a little play around with it and it does seem to work, it works quite well. Um, so I suggest that you try and bookmark these two um, websites um, because if you don't, you'll forget them and you'll never find them again without asking somebody. Um, so these pages have um, a number of the bits of information that I am talking to you about today, all the things that you need to do in your first few weeks. Um, so if you get lost, can't keep track of what exactly you're supposed to be doing, um, do go to, um, to this web page. Um, I want to talk to you briefly about, yes, sorry. Uh, you can also message advice at kcl.ac.uk, which is really helpful. Can you? Yeah. I never knew that. There are, it's there are little nuggets out there. You just need the right person to tell you at the right time, don't you? Um, but yes, I, I mean, I, like I said, I do believe that information availability is, is better than it was before and, um, and they are trying their best to improve it. Um, I want to talk very briefly about the guidance for supervision form. Um, this is one of the things you have to complete in the next um, month, few, yeah, month, in the next month. Um, this is, is fundamentally, it's a list of the responsibilities of your first supervisor, your second supervisor, and you. And um, it looks like a very tediously long list, and it is, but it's, in my view, far more important than you probably realise. And what I'd like you all to make sure happens is you go through this step by step with your first supervisor. Um, that you, this is not just a document that I would recommend you simply sign. There's all kinds of responsibilities and roles in there that first you might not have thought about, but there's also kind of some, some hints at some of the discussions you and your supervisor should have early on. And for example, one of the critical ones for me is deciding between you how you're going to be communicating. How do you like people to communicate with you? I'm awful, I'm a real night owl, so I send emails really late at night. I never, however, ever expect one of my students to respond to me at that time. And I will sit them down and I will say, look, this is what I do. If it gets really annoying, then tell me and I won't do it. But the reason I do send them late at night is just to get them off my in, out of my inbox so it doesn't look like I have so many things to do. Um, so it's a very personal decision how you like to be communicated if you have um, families or care responsibilities and you want to stick to nine to five, then say so. If you don't want to be called at lunchtime on a Sunday, then say so. Personally, I would try my hardest to avoid giving too many people your mobile number. That tends to stop them. But these are really important conversations to have with your supervisor right at the start. 
because otherwise you will find that your supervisor doesn't know what your boundaries are. And then you have to have a weird conversation about, can you please stop calling me on Sunday? This is crazy. Um, so, so the guidance for supervision form, in my view, has a lot of little aspects like that that it's very well worth actually just explicitly having that conversation um, because it helps you to, to avoid any difficulties later. Okay? So, um, supervision basics, and um, I'm very pleased to see that Suki has arrived for his session, nice and early, who is going to talk to you about supervisory issues. Um, some of the other things that I think it's worth trying to make sure you set in advance to avoid any difficulties later is um, have a look at what we think that you should be doing as, as a minimum in terms of supervision. So at King's, your first supervisor is required to meet with you a minimum of once a month. Now, I personally don't think that that's enough, um, and it might be perfect for you. You might be the kind of people that just like to be left alone for a month. Um, some of you will find it impossible to not see your supervisor on a daily basis, perhaps because you're in the same um, open office or because you're working in the lab together or something like that. Um, some of you are a lot more office-based, and it's, a, it's easier to let things drift when that happens. Um, but even if you're in a lab or whatever, and you're seeing your supervisor every day, I want you to walk away from here knowing that I want you to have a dedicated PhD meeting. Okay? So if the only meetings you're having with your supervisor are lab meetings or team meetings or group meetings, that is not a PhD supervision meeting. My advice is to get your supervisor to agree to um, a time that you can put in the diary and it can be there for three years. So I, for example, have slots in my diary. Every Tuesday I meet, I have slots for every single one of my PhD students. That's weekly. Now I cancel them. I get busy, I can't always come. Sometimes they can't come and they cancel it. So on average I probably meet them twice a month. But it's always there um, stopping me from um, you know, coming up with a million excuses why I can't see them for six weeks, okay? So if you can do that, get a recurring event in the diary, do encourage your supervisor to agree. Your second supervisors, you're allowed to meet a lot less often, so maybe every three or four months. Um, and how that works with you is very much dependent on the role of your second supervisor. So some of them are very heavily involved. Some of them are only there for one aspect, one of you know more technical parts of your PhD. Maybe you don't need them for months. I personally think that's fine, but do keep in touch with them because you need to develop a relationship. Because when you do need them, you want it to feel comfortable that you're meet, that you're asking to meet with them. Not it's you don't want it to feel like you're calling cold calling an expert who you've never met before. Okay. So, so do try and have regular meetings, um, even if you don't necessarily need them. Um, we would expect you to meet more often at certain times, so around the upgrades in your first month, um, as you are writing up, as you're getting close to submission, then the frequency is very much likely to increase. The other things I would recommend is try and go with an agenda. Um, it's partly because I think that one of the things we learn in PhDs is just how to take responsibility for our own research. Um, this, after all, is the aim, is to teach you all how to be independent <coughs> researchers. Um, but it also allows you a certain level of control. And this is one of the areas where relationships can start to break down if there's an imbalance in, in the control or, or you're unhappy with the, the balance of, of the control that your supervisor has on your PhD. You know, start right from the start thinking this is my PhD and so um, these are the items that I want to discuss. Um, of course, ask them if they'd like to add anything to the agenda. Um, take some notes. You don't have to have formal minutes, but it is worth keeping a record of what's agreed. A lot of annoying little problems start to um, start to happen when uh, there is, you know, a few weeks after the supervision meeting, you both have a completely different perception of what was agreed. So take some notes, write down, okay, so this is our decision, um, and my advice is to say that out loud and say, right, I'm writing down that we've agreed to this. Um, I know it sounds a little bit over the top, 
But again, you have to bear in mind that I'm used to dealing with the problems that happen when students and supervisors' relationships um, get a bit strained. So it, it, for me, keeping records is always helpful. Okay? So, how much time have I got? I'm now going to move on to how we support you, um, and um, there's a lot out there. Uh, a lot of you, hopefully, will n almost never see me again. You'll be here for three years, and if you've never met me apart from an event that involves wine, then you must be doing well, okay? <laughs> um, those that I do see are usually the ones that are having more of a crisis, um, and so I'll be absolutely thrilled if I see none of you for the next three to six years. Um, but if you do need help, there are, there are a lot of things out there, and, and again, I'm pushing it, but um, don't sit in silence and struggle, because the longer you sit in silence, the worse the struggle's going to get, and the greater the help you're going to need when it really starts to fall apart. Um, so there's lots of people you can turn to. Your first and second supervisors are kind of your first port of call. Um, but there are many others. There are your colleagues and your friends, um, your teammates. There is the education support team. Um, the student forum at the IOPPN um, is a student representative body, um, part of KCLSU, but there's also King's College London Student Union. KCL, I'll put a slide for them later, but this is one of the um, parts of the web that's quite easy to find. They have an amazing array of advice services, um, which I can um, show you in a moment. As I've hinted at, you have access to personal tutors, and Caroline Vance is going to come and talk to you about that in a little while. Um, there are dedicated careers advisors for PhD students, and you'll hear from one later. We have IT and library services who are there for you if you need them. I want you to view these as people who are actually there for you. They're not just there running a library, they are actually there to support our research here at the Institute. We have a ton of training um, that, that you'll hear more about. Um, there is a focus in Kings on health and well-being, so every now and then you'll get emails about events or things that you can take part in. Um, there is your subcommittee chair, the photographs that I showed you earlier, and then there's also me. Like I said, I tend to be the one that deals with some of the worst cases, um, so if you can solve some of the problems before you get to me, great. Um, but believe me, I am always here for all of you, and I'm not kidding no matter how small. Just drop me an email, I will do what I can to help, okay? So this is the student services, the current web page. I'm not sure if it's going to be changed or not. Um, so KCLSU deals with all kinds of stuff, including issues around fees, um, interrupting, transferring or withdrawing. I can tell you a little bit about that in a moment. About money, immigration, disability, the whole work. So um, they will cover all kinds, not just research related problems, obviously that, that's probably not the skill, but issues in your personal life, issues with visas, issues with having no money to live on and living in the streets, talk to them. They have um, some really good quality advisors available and they may come up with things that you would never have thought of on your own. So, um, for me it is a bit of a sliding scale. Like I said, start with those around you, but if, for example, the problem is with your supervisor, then skip step number one. Um, there are always people in every department, particularly the business managers, get to know who they are, but also the administrators across departments who are there to help you with issues around finances, with desk space, with computers, with, with all of that kind of stuff. And then if you want to have more confidential or personal discussions, um, there are a number of options available to you. Your supervisor, if you feel comfortable. If not, personal tutors, um, which you will hear about in a moment. As I've said, education support team, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And me at the end. Um, and I'm not kidding, I am always available. And dead on 2.30. I'm not usually this good. Um, 
What should I say? Good luck. Please stay. Please have a drink. I will be around all afternoon. Um, if there's anything I can tell you a bit more about, then um, just come and find me. Anybody got any burning questions at the moment? Yeah. How do we get the, um, the guidance? It will be sent to you, I'm yes. So Education Support Team will send, it, send it, everything out tomorrow. Um, they are always on top of things, so as long as you keep track of the emails that you get from Education Support Team, you will be keeping up to date. Um, it's very unlikely that you won't get a reminder of something important. In fact, I would su suspect it's impossible, knowing what they're like. Anybody else? Oh! Do you know what? One other thing I didn't, I didn't mention. So I very briefly talked about interruptions, withdrawals, transfers. Um, interruptions, so there are two ways to, um, to deal with, for example, if you need to take some time off. If you're not well or you've got a family member you need to look after or something else happens and you need to take a break from your PhD, can you please do something about it before you take the break, not afterwards? Um, there are two ways of dealing with it. You can um, extend your PhD at the end of your three years. So you have up to, although most of you are doing three-year PhDs, you have up to four years. That is a little bit of a gap for you, you know, a bit of flexibility. So you can extend at the end, but actually it's much better for us, but also I think for your personal well-being if you interrupt. Because if you interrupt, that stops the clock which means that when you come back, you still have the same amount of time as you did when you stopped the clock. So your submission deadline moves forward a bit, but you still have the same amount of time. Um, what that means is that you can continue to feel as if you're working towards a three-year PhD, even though you've had a break. There are obvious reasons for breaks, maternity leave, etc. But if it is something that is personal, please don't just disappear because it's so much easier for me to, to help you to submit on time if I can help you to stop that clock for a while, okay? Um, so do bear that in mind. Uh, we are not allowed to give interruptions retrospectively. So you can't go away for six months and then come back and say, I'm sorry, I've been really ill. I'm actually not allowed to approve an interruption for that. And that would mean that you would then forever know that when you get to the end of your three years, you're going to be stressed because you're not going to finish and you're going to have to get into the pig, etc. Okay. And that's it from me. Thank you all very much. <laughs> um, so next up we have Caroline Vance, who is the IOPPN Personal Tutor Coordinator, and she's going to talk a little bit more about the way personal tutors and others support you. So, hi, as Sarah said, I'm Caroline. Um, personal tutoring at the postgraduate research level is completely different from anything you've had before. So, don't take this wrong, but I really hope I never see any of you again for the whole of your PhD. Because personal tutoring at King's for postgraduate research is, it's not about holding your hand through your research, helping you plan your next experiments. That is going to come from your supervisor, and you've just heard from Suki about that relationship and how that should work. However, it doesn't always work. So, we have a personal tutoring scheme. It is purely pastoral, it is when you are having problems, and I can tell you that 95% of the problems that I see are related, related to student-supervisor relationships. Okay? So, we are a confidential pastoral care. That means, and I can imagine you're sitting there going, well, I'll be fine, I'm never ever gonna need to go and see someone, I'll be absolutely fine but you have no idea what life is going to throw at you for the next three years, six years if you're part-time. You have no idea how tough a PhD may actually turn out to be, and you have no idea at the moment whether or not you and your supervisor are actually going to get on. Some of you may have worked for them before, some of you may have done other things, but until you actually spend day-to-day -day with that person and work with them, you won't know. So, we can discuss anything with you. We can discuss health issues, counselling issues, financial issues, anything else that you think that you might want to talk to somebody confidentially about. We have access to support pages that we can point people in the right direction. And there's quite a lot of us dotted around the campus. And I'll get on to how you can contact them in future. But 
it's really, really important that if you're having a bad time and you can't talk to anybody else and you just, and it's the, it might be something that you think, oh, this is all in my head, am I making it up? Is this something that just applies to me? Nobody else seems to have a problem with this. You could always just go and use personal tutor as a sounding board. But what they are not is they are not a mentor. I recommend getting a mentor. I think it's absolutely essential that you do go and find a mentor, somebody who is not necessarily your supervisor, somebody maybe in the same department, somebody who can help you plan what you want to do after your PhD. But that is not what a personal tutor is for. Okay? But you should go and find a mentor. Um, they're not paperwork admin. Apparently Sarah's offered to do that for you if you've got any problems with that. You just need to send an email to her. There should be, most of you should have in your department, research networks, all the other PhD students, the year two, the year three, postgraduate, like postdocs, they should all be able to provide you with extra help on some of these issues. But, the key point is personal tutoring is there. We are still the only faculty that offer it yeah. um, at King's, um, and it is used more than I would like it to be used. Um, but it turns out, therefore, it's actually an absolutely essential uh, part of this process. So if you guys could, the problem is, we're gonna send you these slides, and at the moment, you'll probably be absolutely fine for the six, first six months. So can I make a recommendation that you save these slides when you get sent them, somewhere that you're going to be able to find them, so that when you go, because the King's website is almost impossible to navigate, so if you actually want to find anything on there, you're going to have to follow the link in the slides. And there is a, uh, under research study, under research students, there is a personal tutor page, and that is how you get in contact with us. We recently rejigged the system. We used to just give everybody a personal tutor and the idea was they would meet with them, uh, get to know them and then could go and see them if they had any problems. This was absolutely fine apart from often personal tutors would leave without telling anybody or would be away for long periods of time or just would never have any availability. Or, if I'm honest, really resented being personal tutors and were only doing it because we told them they had to. So we rejigged the system and we asked people to volunteer for doing it. So we now have a core group of people who all have volunteered to be personal tutors who are all interested in the well-being of our PhD students and making sure that they can get through their PhD. And they are all listed on this website. So if you go to the website and follow the links and you can see that we've also got mentoring and we've got counselling and health, mental health support on there. The tutors are spread all across the different departments, so if some of you are from guys, there are people up there, if some of you are based here, if you've got in a small department, you may have a problem with your supervisor and there is nobody in your department that you could actually talk to about that, you can go to a different department. There are males, there are females, there are senior professors down to postdocs. There is a whole range of people of, that you can go and talk to for whatever is comfortable for you. My name is Top, so I do tend to get the most contacts of anybody else, but I'm always here and happy to talk to people. And this is what the page looks like, so you can scroll down and have a look at all the different tutors. I think we might even actually change a little bit now, and now we're all just photos with little bits of details underneath. Um, so, if there is anything, just send me an email. Um, we, have, we do have rules, like you are, personal tutors have to have an out of office on, so that if you email them and you get an out of office, you know not to expect a response. Um, you should get a response within 48 hours of emailing a personal tutor. If you don't, either email that personal tutor again or move to somebody else on the list. Okay, I think there's 25 that we end up with, something like that. So there's quite a lot of personal tutors. Um, and they are all lovely people and they will all be able to help you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, and I, I don't. I want to add very, very briefly and stress what Caroline's already said. The beauty of the the new system is that all of these people have volunteered and therefore they want to do this. But more importantly, it gives us the opportunity, well, Caroline, to organise for them to be all appropriately and properly trained and given all the support that they need. So um, we think it works well. But let us know if you think differently. Right, 
Thanks very much, Caroline. We are now going to move on um, to meet Kate Murray, who is based over in the Centre for Doctoral Studies, and she's here to talk to us about careers and employability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Sarah says, my name's Kate Murray. I'm one of the three careers consultants uh, that work specifically with um, researchers uh, here at King's, and it's a real great pleasure always to be here um, on the first, sort of the first day, you've been here a bit already, haven't you? But sort of, more or less, the first day of your time here. Um, I've met a couple of you, I think, at uh, the main induction last week, um, up in that extremely hot canteen. Uh, so uh, so that, that was lovely as well. I'm slightly conscious, actually, that my slides may well replicate some of what you heard from my colleague Amy Moore last week. So I'm going to try a slightly different spin and tell you a bit of a story. Um, about uh, a, a former PhD student, someone who was more or less in your shoes not that long ago, as I go through explaining uh, what it is that we have to offer you. So, um, a reminder of the other names, again, um, some of you are probably based at Guy's, um, and my colleague Don Donald Lush um, is the careers consultant based at Guy's, so it may well be more convenient that you, uh, that you go and find him uh, for appointments and things like that, and, but you can talk to any of the three of us. So, a reminder, oh look, the slides have gone funny. Isn't that annoying? They're so beautifully designed and then you put them on a different system and the Y goes in the wrong place. A reminder, in case this didn't happen for you last week, of uh, two elements. We are King's Careers and Employability and the, that means that there are two things. There's your career and then there's your employability. And at King's we define career around who you are and where you think you're going to go. So it's that very personal thing, that iterative journey of you constantly reimagining who you are, redefining who you are, and thinking where you're going to go and, and, and what that looks like, where you're going to get there. And I know from my own experience uh, that it's something that I go through very, probably every six months or so, I'm constantly thinking, is this really the right thing for me to be doing? Who am I still? And yes, here I still am. So, so it's an iterative journey. You've made lots of decisions to get yourself sitting here in this room already. You've already had to do a lot of this stuff. Your employability, on the other hand, is that portfolio of knowledge, attributes, skills, and experience, that stuff which is all about you, that enables you to get where you want to go on your journey. So those are the two things. The careers, who am I, where am I going? Employability, what do I need to get me there? And the things that we do here, and the stuff that you're anyway doing as a research student here, help develop both those elements of yourself. So you may remember from Amy last week that uh, we divide up your career journey into three different elements. I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you to confess right here, right now, which one you think you're in. And I know that people cycle around quite often, uh, depending what experiences they've had. But we think that uh, some of you will be in Discover, and in fact you'll have been asked these, but you'll have been asked some questions when you enrolled, um, and we will know how many of you think that you're currently in Discover. So you're a bit uncertain about what you have to offer and what you might do, although you're quite certain because you're sitting here in this room, so you've done some decisions already. Focus is when you're beginning to make more sense of it and you've got a few options and you're needing to choose between them. And then into action when you're ready and you know what the next step is and you, you feel able to move on. So our aim, I suppose, is that you've gone through quite a lot of this process by the time you're sort of six months out from the end of your PhD and six months-ish out uh, before the end of your PhD, we'd like you to be in action. So I have no way of monitoring that particularly. I know where you are each year. I don't know where you are just towards the end of your PhD. But we would really like you to have cycled through a lot of this learning and got to action by that stage. Because we know that if you're there, then you're going to be making really good decisions about what the next thing is for you. So I suppose that's, part of, that's a bit of a plea to be making the most of your time here, to be cycling through this stuff such that at that point in time, uh, you know uh, what you need to do to get yourself into the best place possible uh, as you go forward. And here is the lady about whom I'm going to be telling you today's story, or at least illustrating many of the elements today. Her name is Nadine. Uh, she was a King's PhD and a King's postdoc. Um, and uh, she definitely went through these cycles um, through many conversations with me and with other colleagues here at King's. So she's going to be illustrative, oh, that was too many T's, illustrative of, uh, of these, these elements. So, if you were in Discover, what things might you be doing? What things did Nadine do? So, she came um, and had, I would say, probably two or three conversations, one-to-one -one appointments, 
with me and with colleagues, um, probably end of her first year, maybe beginning of her second year. She and through those conversations, what Nadine was able to do was decide that what she, what was going to be important to her, was to use her research, her skills, her PhD level research skills, for the improvements of the NHS. Wow, a lofty, a lofty aim and a very broad aim, and she wasn't quite sure what that looked like, but that was the thing that she wanted to do. So we, we got there, uh, she was discovering more about what, what she was interested in. We got there through those appointments, that was something that she brought to those appointments. Then some other things, and you, you've got on the, the slide some other things that when you get into focus, the kinds of things that you might want to do. Nadine was really good at coming to some of our departmental events, some of the events that we ran um, specifically for researchers. Um, and one thing that she particularly did was come to um, an event where there were three or four people from a kind of life science consulting background. And she came along to these events, um, and she went. And she had a good old chat to, to one of the people presenting um, at that event. So by attending that, she found out more what the, that job was about, and she found out that people with PhDs, obviously with the kinds of research and analytical skills that people develop uh, through all the different subjects that people study, you're developing those research and analytical skills. And she found out that one way of trying to improve things whether that's for pharmaceutical companies, for the NHS, for who knows who, is by being a life science consultant. So she's had the idea, she came to some events, um, and then the next thing that she needed to do uh, was to put her plans into action. So Nadine joined uh, an organisation called Cheeky Scientist, which is a sort of networking um, organisation, to practice what it was like uh, to go and sort of talk to people that she didn't really know, um, and to practice meeting other people who are similarly like-minded. Um, so she, she did that kind of thing. She came and she was using the one-to-one -one appointments, again, quite a lot more with us, just to kind of check that this was really right and, and some job hunting techniques. Um, and then we spent quite a lot of time talking about CVs and applications. Nothing came of this. Nothing came of this. Poor old Nadine was very disheartened. At the end of her PhD, she hadn't got the job that she thought she wanted to get. It just hadn't worked out for her. Um, but what she did, she picked herself up and she went through this process again. All right, that's fine. Um, I haven't got the life science consulting job, probably because she didn't have the business experience. That was probably the thing. So what she did, she went off um, and she did a postdoc as sometimes happens, her supervisor dangled some nice money in front of her and she was able to have another job um, at King's for a year or so, uh, finishing up writing some papers, starting off some other projects. So that was good because it gave her a bit of breathing <coughs> space to, to be able to kind of go through this process again. And she found a job with an organisation called the CBRE. Now, initials, but not NHS, so, or EY, or any of those, or PwC. CBRE is a great big real estate company. So far, so good. So far, so far away from the NHS. How is this helping the NHS? But the bit of CBRE that she worked for, she was a researcher, so the connection was there. The bit of CBRE that she worked for was the real estate bit looking after health properties. So what she was having to do was look at demographic data, look at, I don't know, commercial property value data. I don't know what data it was. But she was using her, her PhD level research skills to look at the data and make uh, uh, suggestions, proposals to clients about where to next site their pharmacy or their care home or their doctor's surgery, whatever it might be. CBRE, to their credit, noticed, thank goodness, that she had a doctor in front of her name and that she was very good at research and they got her training some more of their researchers and their analysts. So she went in at a relatively junior level. Nice paid, very nice offices. <laughs> very nice offices, just off Oxford Street. Nice canteen in the basement, lovely. So she went in at quite junior level. They promoted her quite quickly because they saw what she was capable of doing. And she stayed there for around about 15, 18 months. The next thing that she did was moving into Deloitte, into the Life Science Consulting Division. And the person that she went to work with at Deloitte was the person that she had done the networking with at the Life Science panel three or four years previously at King's. So her story completely illustrates how if you come and do some stuff with us, and if you take the opportunities that are on offer here, and you find a vision and you work towards it, that it's possible to get 
where you want to go. So Nadine is a fantastic example for me. Not just because uh, she's great, she's a really positive story, and she's lovely because she keeps in contact as well, which I really like. But also because, bless her heart, she's offered a, a, a <coughs> workshop to 15 lucky King's PhDs and research staff to go to Deloitte offices uh, to find out what it's like to be a life science consultant. Now, I know that not everybody in this room wants to do that. But I also know that lots of people in this room want to use their PhD level research skills in the future. And that's one way of doing it. And going and having an opportunity and seeing what it's like in a different environment is not a bad idea. So Nadine, bless her heart, uh, really does come full circle for me in offering uh, conversations with you lot uh, in the future. The other event that's up there that I really wanted to draw your attention to is this one. It's the life what do we call it, Life and Health Sciences Careers event at the Crick Institute. I'll have these upstairs later on. So I'm sure you're aware the Crick Institute is that uh, collaboration between King's and UCL and Imperial. And we have got an event happening it's Monday the 28th of October in the late afternoon, early evening. There are 22 employers coming to that event and they are offering jobs at all different levels, whether graduates, whether experienced hire, whether a PhD level um, entry, to people from all sorts of disciplines. And if I just look, uh, there are a couple of genetics, genomics companies, for example, um, coming. Then there's one that is, I've never heard of this company, it's called MSD UK. We're inventing for life, it says. Blah, 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 blah. Our scientists are among the first to develop <laughs> medicines to treat hypertension, HIV, and hepatitis C. Fine, I know, not very relevant to you people in this room. However, for more than 10 years, MSD scientists have been researching different ways to treat Alzheimer's disease. So it might not look like they've got IOPPN type characteristics in them, but if you delve, delve deep into the company descriptions and you think really broadly about the skills that you're developing as researchers, then there are 22 employers who'd be really interested to meet you. It is my aim that I get IOPPN PhD students to that event, Monday the 28th of October. You sign up uh, two weeks beforehand. There are limited places, because really annoyingly, Imperial and UCL students have to come too. Um, but I would like you all to make the trip up to the Crick, to make the trip to, the, to King's Cross, to find out what the possibilities are, where you can take your PhD level research skills, because there are very many reasons to be cheerful um, about what you're going to be developing while you're here. So come and have a chat to me upstairs. Ooh, that's Amy. Um, but the most important thing is that, and it's been on pretty much every slide, please go to Career Connect. Everybody's got this little card in their red bag. Go to Career Connect, tailor your profile uh, to make sure that you get um, the right information coming into your inbox. Um, Career Connect is the means by which you can book appointments with me here at Denmark Hill, other people at other campuses, um, and it's the means by which you can attend our events as well. So I wish you well with your PhD. Congratulations on being here. Enjoy it. Everybody talks about all the problems and support you're going to need. You probably will. But I would like to say uh, really well done. Uh, there are so many reasons to be cheerful about your PhD, about embarking on it. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I might make an appointment to see her myself later. I've <laughs> been doing this for too long. <laughs> right, and, and another one who's going to uh, come along and tell me um, how to improve myself as a researcher <laughs> is Amy Moore, who is from a very, very newly arrived yeah. at the Centre for Doctoral <laughs> Studies, so be gentle with her. And um, she is going to talk to you about some of the doctoral student development opportunities um, at the CDS. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. I uh, hope you're having a good day. It's lovely to be here down at Denmark Hill. It's my second trip here, not the first, so uh, good to see so many of you in the room. Um, I probably recognise a few faces, so how many of you were at the CDS induction last week? Hands up. Okay, a good number but not everyone, so that's kind of a relief to me. Some of it will be stuff I talked about at that 
talk, um, but hopefully there'll be one or two things there that perhaps you didn't remember because you had a lot to take in in that, in that day, um, and hopefully helpful for you. So I just wanted to actually echo what Kate was saying, which is congratulations. It's incredible to secure a PhD down here. Um, at one of the like, world leading places. So um, I'm really excited, I'm sure you are too, about what the next few years are going to bring for you and really make the most of your time here. Um, so, as Sarah said, I'm Amy, I work in the Centre for Doctoral Studies. I have only been here for two and a half months, um, but I have been working with PhD students and research staff for a number of years prior to that. I was at the Institute of Cancer Research for 10 years. I started off as a postdoc and did my PhD at Bristol before that on cancer research, obviously. But um, I did a year of postdoc and then I um, used the career service at uh, the University of Bristol um, to look at uh, other options and I moved into this kind of thing, research, development and training. I never knew when I was a PhD student that this was an option for pe people with PhDs. Um, I was very happy to find out that it was. And um, so maybe one of you or a few of you may end up doing a similar thing as well. So it's, yeah, as Kate was saying, um, it's the future is bright in terms of career opportunities. And so what I'm going to talk to you about is the sort of skills development training that's available to you here at, at King's. And these are not just skills to leave academia, okay? So really important skills to be really good researchers, um, to be really effective, to maximise your research outputs while you're here, to forge strong relationships and collaborations that are going to stand you in good stead for the future, as well as um, widening your experiences and doing some exciting things that um, doing a PhD gives you the opportunity to do, so things like public engagement, um, communication and all that kind of thing. So I think you might have seen this slide before, some of you at least, but I guess I'd like to start by pointing out that you're part of a, a big community of PhD students here at King's. There are around 3,000. Um, you can see IOPPN, which is the brown bit, is quite big in terms of numbers. Um, and uh, some of the other large faculties that you might also interact with, life sciences and medicine, and then social science and public policy, they're the other big ones. But, you know, I think that's important to remember that there are lots of PhD students out there and, and you know, make the most of, of being part of that community. So the Centre for Doctoral Studies, we're based in the Waterloo campus um, and our mission is equipping research students to excel and we do that through four key areas, support, community, funding and training. So what do I mean by that? So support is about providing frameworks, regulations, policies and guidance and information to help you be able to do your PhD. So that's things uh, like the, the way that you progress, the way that you upgrade, all that kind of thing. And that's there alongside all of the departmental guidance and um, rules and regulations and faculty level guidance that's, that's available. Um, community. So we want to help nurture a collaborative and welcoming environment for research students across King. We do that in various ways. We're looking at building things like online communities, um, working closely with student networks, so that running things like events and so on. So funding, um, we do. There is some funding for PhDs available through the Centre for Doctoral Studies, uh, not a lot. But what might be interesting to you guys, as you are here, um, is the funding that you can apply for. So that's a really good thing to think about as you go through your PhD, it, you know, particularly if you want to stay in an academic career, but even if you don't, to be able to secure your own funding, and I'm talking about small grants here, so for things like travel funding to go to conferences, we, offer, we run a scheme twice a year. Uh, public engagement, if you want to do some activities, um, we can offer up to £750 towards public engagement activities. These are really good skills to, to put into practice to win, win this funding and um, do some exciting stuff. And lastly, training, which is sort of the bit I'm mostly responsible for, and I'll come on to explain a bit more about that. So, these are sort of four things I think are worth thinking about at the start of your PhD, and you've probably heard this from people already today and from colleagues and supervisors. Make sure you do understand the pathway of the PhD here at King's. It's, 
it may not be the same as friends who are doing PhDs at other universities, but make sure you know about upgrade, that you know how long you are registered for and what your submission deadline is. That is really important. Um, so I can show you where there's information about that. Really key, second point, is agree expectations with your supervisor and know where you can find help. So have conversations about that early on. And I mean, so some of the common times when the students have problems is because they haven't had explicit conversations with key people about, um, so particularly supervisors, about how things, how that you're going to communicate, what, how to prepare for meetings and things like that. So do make sure you have those conversations early on. Explore the King's community, build your support network. So um, maybe you're lucky enough to already know people here. Maybe you know you should all be getting to know each other today and in the future as, as part of the same cohort starting at the same time. When tough things are tough, and the, it isn't easy doing a PhD, it's the people you have around you, your support networks here and outside of that, so friends and family, don't neglect them. They will be the ones who get you through that. And I can talk from personal experience of having a really hard first year of my PhD and genuinely thinking I might not carry on. Um, and I think it was the cohort, the, the people around me, there were about 12 of us who started together, being able to have open conversations with them and say, I'm really struggling with this, and then understanding. That was so important, so don't neglect that. And then think about your wider training and career development. So um, this is the website. I won't. I won't talk you through this, I'm sure you can find it with your fantastic Googling skills, but it's the Centre for Doctoral Studies website. And here I've circled in the red just some uh, what I think are really useful bits to look at. Um, so some information for new PGR students and stuff around the key milestones that I mentioned, including eventually submission and examination, which will be um, happy, happy times. Um, and these are some useful questions that you can use when you're talking to your supervisor early on and kind of establishing how that's going to work. Um, I pinched these from a colleague at Sheffield University, but I think they're really useful. Um, so, you know, why not bring them along in, your, in one of your early supervisor meetings and, and talk through some of those. And just to point out a few networks that exist at King's. Now, I think you're in a really great place because I know that a lot happens down here um, in IOPPN and at Denmark Hill in terms of student representation, in terms of um, events and um, that kind of thing. So, you know, I think the students down here really have a voice, which is fantastic. Um, there are a few kind of college-wide uh, initiatives. So the King's Doctoral Students Association, this is, as I say, a college-wide association with representatives from all the faculties and this uh, grouping we meet with regularly and um, has a the, the chair goes to the formal meeting uh, postgraduate research um, student subcommittee that reports directly into King's research college college research committee so that's like a really senior committee in King's so this is a really good route to have issues raised if you feel that they are a college-wide issue um, but obviously you've got people within within your departments and Sarah and um, Sarah sort of sits on that that committee as well so uh, really useful and other other examples there I won't go through more but you know it's you're in London you're at King's there's loads going on so just get involved so as I say, we are interested in student feedback. We want students to represent the, the groups that they are based in. Um, so there are, as I say, networks within and down here, but then also at the college level. And you can get in touch with us at any point if you have any suggestions of things that you think we could be doing better. Um, and then the last bit there, the postgraduate research experience survey. So this is a survey that runs every two years at King's but also at the other universities. Um, if you've done a degree in the UK already, you probably feel like you're over-surveyed because um, there's a lot of surveys going around. I would really urge you to complete this because we take this data really seriously. Um, so it goes to all PhD students at King's and um, it did run last year so it won't be next year, it will be in your second year. But this is where we ask you about your experience of important things supervision of uh, facilities, of the quality and diversity issues of training, and um, so it's an important feedback mechanism for us. 
Okay, so this is the research and development framework, and this is important to me because this is about skills development and training, and this aims to illustrate the different skills that are important to develop as a researcher. Um, so uh, there are 63 skills around the edge um, there, so I won't go through all of them, but this is based on a piece of research that was carried out a few years ago by this organisation called VTI, and VTI are kind of a national organisation that champions researcher development in the UK. So uh, what I would say with this is, and so our programme of training is designed to kind of help and support your development in all of these areas. You will develop loads of these skills just in the course of your research, um, as you learn how to analyse data, as you have conversations with people, you learn how to network, how to um, collaborate and so on, how to present. But there are things that we offer that can hopefully help even more for you to d develop those skills. Now it might be that you bring this with you and have a conversation with your supervisor and, and say, at the early stage or later on, you know, could we talk through this? I think I'm strong in this, but less strong in this area. What do you suggest or get their feedback on what they think would be useful? So it's just a nice framework in terms of understanding how you can develop professionally. This is our website, uh, so it's KCL Doctoral Training. This is the way that you can access and find out about all the support that we offer through the Centre for Doctoral Studies. Um, you should have a copy of this if you came to the CDS induction. If not, it is online. Um, I know that we save the trees, we don't all need a copy. Um, and this really outlines a lot of the opportunities. So we provide support through three core means of delivery, workshops, one-to-one -one sessions and online. We're building more and more online training because we know you can't always travel across site, that you're busy, you know, um, and you want to be able to learn in your own time and to fit around you. So we're doing more and more blended learning, which is kind of a combination of self-paced material and then webinars and some live stuff so that you can um, do some, some interaction as well. And they're based around eight themes. So careers and employability essentially is stuff that Kate and, and her team provide, um, you, but you can get into that through our pages as well. And then these other core areas, communication and impact and so on, I won't go through all of them. Um, doctoral essentials are a really popular stream of what we do, so we would do stuff around how to prepare for the upgrade, um, how there's a session around starting your PhD and about kind of project management and that kind of thing, and then we do a popular one around preparing for vivas for when you get towards the end. Um, but there's loads there. And also the, the brochure does talk about other opportunities, not just um, stuff that we provide. So there's loads of other stuff going on. You might want to take part in the um, three minute thesis competition, which is a brilliant uh, competition that you might have heard of, where you can um, present your PhD thesis in three minutes with one slide to a lay audience. And you there are cash prizes for um, King's winners. So things like that, there's loads of stuff going on. And my colleague Matthew Coleman is gonna be upstairs uh, over the drinks and he's got a stand about the Health Sciences Doctoral Training Centre. So this is a programme of support that we offer for all of the, for students in the four health sciences faculties. Um, and it's obviously a bit more tailored to people doing health science research. So there's a lot of methodology, statistics type of training accessible through there. Um, and they run events, a symposium, we're going to do a buddy scheme this year. So if it's something of interest, do, um, do go along, talk to Matthew, uh, go and get a free pen and a brochure and find out what, what stuff's going to be happening this year. They also run this podcast, po post Docalypse, if I can pronounce that. So uh, check that out on your um, favourite podcast app. It's really, it's really good, actually. That was something that the students started um, and has carried on going, so I'm very pleased with that. Uh, this is Skills Forge, this is how you book onto things. Uh, need I say more? There's the dates of things are on there, so you will, you will definitely have, a, it will be logging into this at some point, and it's just your KCL credentials. And then, I think probably near the end now, this is one thing I really wanted to point out. So those of you who are at the CDS induction, I asked them to wave in the Massive Lecture Theatre. These guys, Roz and Wahid, are our Royal Literary Fund Fellows. So they are professional writers and they're on site at King's two days a week each. 
so Tuesdays to Fridays. And as I say, they're professional writers and they can provide you a one-to-one -one session um, and give you feedback on your writing. And I think it's, it is one of the hardest things when you, when you are on your, doing a PhD is, is knowing how to write, how to um, overcome writer's block, how to write papers, how to write your thesis. So it's a really valuable source of support. You just need to email them and they basically organise their appointments and uh, that's totally free. So do look out for that and as I say, the details are on the website. So that was a very whistle-stop tour through um, the stuff that we provide through the Centre for Doctoral Studies. Do you go and talk to Matthew over the drinks? Um, look out for our bulletin. So we send an email that looks like this, although not exactly the same, uh, once a month to all of our PhD students. Um, I know you'll probably get a lot of emails, but keep an eye out for it. We will. It is the primary way we advertise things like the grants and the funding that I mentioned, um, new stuff that's happening. Um, if you want to get involved in KDSA, that kind of thing. So, you know, it's a really important means for us to contact you. And these are our other contact details, the website and the Twitter and so on. So that's it. Any, any questions? Cool. Well, you know, get in touch if you do and um, just good luck. Enjoy it and I uh, hope to see some of you soon. Thanks. Um, so we're on to our last half now, and then you can be released. Uh, and we have, next up is Rebecca, who's going to talk to us about women in the world. I did um, introduce this very slightly earlier, but I'll let you give them the full details. Thank okay, you. so hello everyone, I'm Rebecca. Um, so I am a second year PhD student, I'm just going into my second year now. Um, I'm here on the MRC uh, studentship, so if any of you are on the MRC programme, you've probably already seen me and you would have already seen my talk, so apologies for the repetition. Um, but this is basically just to talk you through um, a network that I started um, here at King's. Um, so just a bit of backstory, um, before I started my PhD, I was a research assistant for a year, um, and during that time I started this network. So. To answer your first question, um, Women of the Wall <laughs> is a staff and student network um, which was based where I've been working for the past couple of years, which is the Morris Wall Clinical Neuroscience Institute. So those of you who have projects at the Wall, you should know where this is already. Um, but for those of you who don't, we're just over on the other side of the road by the hospital on the far side of the car park, this building over here. Um, so, hence the name Women of the Wall is a catchy name, it's kind of stuck, but we have actually expanded beyond just the wall now. We now are a student society across Kings, um, and so our events and everything that we do are open to everyone across Kings, but we kind of started out here at the IOP. Um, so who are we? This is me, obviously. Um, and this is my treasurer, who is Angela Perry, she's a second year PhD student also based at the wall. Um, so we're both in the basic and clinical neuroscience department. Um, and so what do we do? So basically I started this network because I looked around me and just around the campus and there was no real discussion going on, let alone actions being taken in relation to um, gender equality in STEM specifically. There are a couple of great societies across the whole of Kings, but as you've kind of heard before, um, Denmark Hill can be a little bit of an isolated campus and they don't always bring their events down here to us, hence why we've got this great student body and this student voice that people were talking about that has been born in, in this campus because we've kind of sorted ourselves out in that respect. Um, so I decided to start this as a discussion platform so that we were actually talking about some of the issues um, affecting equality in STEM. Um, and importantly, how we can actually make changes happen that address this. Um, and our second aim is um, putting on events and skills training that enable people to thrive and overcome these obstacles themselves when they can. So obviously there are a lot of societal um, issues affecting gender equality in STEM, and those are the big things that we want to change. But uh, and the answer is not fixing individuals, as it were, but we do put on 
uh, workshops and things where we can kind of give you the best tools available to deal with the current system. So an example of this I'm going to talk about a bit later is our negotiation skills workshops, um, which we've run three times now. I'll tell you a bit more about those uh, in a couple of slides time. Um, so what we also do is campaign for change um, to hopefully uh, make things a bit more equal here at King's. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about that as well. Um, and also just providing this community base for people. So um, I'm sure you've heard about this before in sort of discussions on well-being and student support here available, but sometimes doing a PhD can be really isolating and you may be experiencing uh, certain obstacles and challenges, whether that's your supervisor relationship or the working environment in your department. But if you're isolated and you tend to think that these things are just you, um, but actually you'll find that if you have a community base to talk to, you'll find someone with a common experience and realise that actually you're not alone in whatever you're experiencing. So that was one of the main ideas as well behind starting this network. So we've got this support base so that we can kind of help each other out as well. Um, and finally, I also just want to emphasise that although we're called Women of the World, this is kind of a catch-all. We are basically for equality in all fronts in STEM, so we are for everyone. I always get asked this when we have our events and campaigns and initiatives. It's always, oh, but I'm not a woman or I don't identify as a woman, can I come to your events? The answer is yes, it's always yes. We're never going to turn anybody away. And I particularly speak as well to those who identify as men in the audience. Um, please do engage and come to our events. We really, really need more of you um, because we can't fix this um, by ourselves and by having these discussions by ourselves. Um, sort of having events and panel discussions and things where we're talking about these problems but only women are in the room is not helpful because we already know what all the problems are. We kind of need everybody and we need all hands on deck to try and make change happen to solve these problems. So I would encourage you to get involved as well because we are a really friendly, welcoming environment. Um, so please don't find our name off-putting or like you're not involved. We really want you guys to um, come and uh, get involved as well. Um, so just a bit about what we do. So uh, I mentioned that we campaign. This is our um, I Mind the Gap campaign, which we ran last November to mark UK Equal Pay Day. Um, so UK, UK Equal Pay Day is basically the gender pay gap in practice. Um, so it varies, um, but all companies have to report um, their gender pay gap data um, as a legal requirement uh, if they employ more than 250 people. So we can kind of get data on this from different companies and it goes on at King's. Um, the Diversity and Inclusion Department here do a lot of hard work on that. Um, but the principle around UK Equal Pay Day is that um, it effectively, it falls in November for the whole of the UK, um, that at what point do women effectively start working for free because of the gender pay gap? Um, and so for last year, it was the 14th of November. Um, so we'll be running a similar campaign to raise awareness around that um, this year as well. Um, but you may already have seen a lot of people walking around with these Mind the Gap badges. That was part of our campaign to raise awareness of this. Um, so just out of interest, does anyone know what the gender pay gap is at King's? Anyone want to have a guess? Go for it. You look like you want to have a guess. Okay. It's 17.8 percent, which has come down over the last couple of years, but obviously it's still not good enough. So there's still a lot of work to be done on that. Um, so I will also be up in the reception later. I have a very very small number of badges left because uh, the other induction has cleaned them out. Um, so if you want to come and grab one of those, come and be quick and come and see me upstairs later. Um, so I also mentioned skills. Um, we do uh, skills workshops. So far we've been doing our negotiation skills workshops which tied in, we launched these last year as part of our gender pay gap uh, campaign. Um, like I said, we want to fix the system um, and until we can do that, it kind of helps to give everyone the best advantage that they can. So this was centered around negotiating pay. And so one of our aims is to make training like this actually interesting and engaging and different to just sort of sitting in a lecture theatre, taking some notes, going away and not remembering any of it. So we worked really, really hard with um, Diversity and Inclusion, who are great on this campus, um, and also this theatre company called REACT um, to design this workshop that was interactive. So it basically centres around, um, so in the top photo you have um, our two actors who are great, Brad and Marianne, they're basically acting out um, a conversation that's quite difficult. It's essentially this woman going into 
uh, a meeting with that head of department wanting to negotiate several different things. Um, and you'll find yourselves in similar discussions uh, even as a PhD student. So you may not be negotiating for your salary, um, but you'll definitely be negotiating for things like um, students, resources, whether you have to take on different responsibilities in the lab, things like that. So um, they essentially act out this scenario. The first time around it goes awful. She leaves the room without gaining anything that she wanted. Um, and then the whole workshop centers around sort of uh, small group discussion on things you can do to kind of um, negotiate for what you want assertively. There's lots of really good techniques that they use. Um, natural practical stuff that you can take away with you and then at the end they repeat the theatre performance and everyone in the audience has to direct using what they've just learned otherwise it goes exactly the same way as it goes the first time so we've run this three times now it's sold out every single time so it's super popular um, unfortunately you guys have just missed it we ran one on the 24th of September but we will be doing it again because it's so popular so uh, keep your eyes out for this reappearing um, we also do less formal, um, more social kind of events. So this is what we did to mark International Women's Day. Um, this year we hosted this um, hour of speed networking with the amazing woman in the centre there. So essentially this was just an informal uh, lunch hour where we had these different networking stations, each one of these uh, different women with different perspectives from their experience in academia. And essentially, everyone who attended could rotate around them in small stations. And it was an hour where you could just ask them anything you want, just off the record. Ask them whatever you want about the challenges, um, their story, how they've got to where they are. Um, we'll definitely be doing this again to mark the next International Women's Day. And it's possibly one of my favorite events that we've run so far. Um, it was really well attended, and there was a really good atmosphere. And lots of people took a lot away from it. So we'll definitely be doing that again. Um, so we also run uh, seminar events on a reasonably regular basis. We've run some on um, around our gender pay gap um, campaign about negotiating and sort of hearing actual real life stories from women in academia who've kind of taken the step to advocate for their salary and asking for more. Um, and then we also recently ran one on everyday bias and the kind of really subtle, insidious ways that uh, academia uh, is challenging for women, not just women, but other groups as well, um, because it's quite difficult to always pin down what is not okay. Um, so we ran a seminar on this, particularly looking at the perspective of women and parents and how the whole academic system tends to push them out in terms of time, commitment, and a lot of other factors. Um, so we host seminars very regularly. And so we have a few things coming up soon. Uh, so Wellbeing Week is in October this month. Uh, 21st to the 25th, and that's across Kings, but we're doing a couple of events to mark this. Um, so we're running a panel discussion on the 22nd called Everything is Fine, let's talk about academic burnout. Um, and we've got a really, really great panel lined up for this, including actually Sarah, who you've heard from, and also Caroline, they're both on our panel. Um, we've got loads of other people as well speaking, we've got representatives from the LGBTQ network. Um, the Race Equality Network, we've got people working in mental health research, um, people with experience as mental health nurses, and a couple of PhD students who've also started really great initiatives around mental health and inequality themselves. Um, so we'll be launching this event really, really soon. Um, and then on the Thursday of that week, on the 24th, we also have a more social, more relaxed kind of event um, called the Wellbeing Festival, because we love a pun. Um, and this is basically going to involve a lot of different um, activity stalls, um, crafts, and mini improv workshops where everyone can just kind of take time out from research. I know you're just starting, but you can take some time out from your research um, and sort of set a good habit. Um, and just kind of get to know each other, bring our communities together a bit more, and just kind of relax over some activities and chat about well-being if you want. But it's just a nice social occasion as well. Um, so we'll be launching these really soon. Um, the best places to find out what is happening and when, where to sign up, um, is on our social media, which is on the slides. Um, we also have a mailing list. Um, I'll be up in the canteen later and you can come and sign up to be on our mailing list. Um, you can also join us on KCLSU, um, which would be great if you could because that really helps us out as a society. Um, it's free. 
um, because we're an equality group, so obviously it's free. Um, you can just log in using your K number, as usual, on kclsu.org, search us in the activity groups, and you should be able to find us. If you're a student, which all of you are, I think you want uh, just standard membership, um, and it's associate membership for staff, any staff who are interested. Um, so also signing up here automatically adds you to our mailing list, so either way you'll be in touch uh, with us and we'll be able to update you. The first people to hear about what's happening will be via our mailing list, so definitely suggest signing up to that. Um, I think that's it from me, so um, I'll, like I said I'll be upstairs, so if you want to come and chat about how you can get involved, um, any ideas you have, we love to sort of hear from everyone about things that you actually want us to address or future events you want us to hold. Um, and I'm also a PhD student, so um, I'm happy to chat about any questions you might have about just generally doing a PhD. Um, yeah, so I'll be upstairs, so come and say hello. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yusuf El Tawil, LT, um, and I'm a fourth year medical student at King's. I'm actually not really at the IOPPN much, um, but I've been here for a very long time. Um, and I actually work for the Students' Union. So the Students' Union, um, King's College London Students' Union, is a separate organisation, um, a body which is not actually to do really much with the university. We run our own processes and we have a lot of things um, that go on which I can talk to you more about through this presentation. So how you and KCLSU, um, it is run for students, by students, these are elected student officers. So every year around March time, um, we elect our student officers for the next academic year. Um, there's six student officers, there's a president, a vice president postgraduate, vice president welfare, vice president education for the health schools, vice president education for arts and sciences, and there's a vice president um, activities and development. Each of them ha have come obviously on their own campaigns and their own objectives, and um, yeah, you can speak to them about um, what their objectives are. It would be really good actually for you to get in touch with them and speak to them about what campaigns they're sort of running, because um, you know, their campaign is only as good as the support that they get from you guys as students. So it would be very, very helpful for you guys to maybe look online and see what they're interested in doing and the impact they're trying to make at the university. Um, so what are the perks of being a member of KCSU, which you all automatically are? Um, so we have student activities. I think we're the biggest um, student union in terms of activities across the country. We have over 300 um, student groups. Um, yeah, anything ranging really from baking or cheese society all the way to Harry Potter. I think we've had games of Game of Thrones as well. We've got a geek society, which is really cool. Um, so you could, there's a lot to see really and get involved with, um, ranging from cultural to, or religious groups to interests and hobbies. Um, there's somewhere for you to meet um, and get to know people with shared interests as you. Um, and that's just showing um, our freshers there. I don't know if you guys actually managed to get to go to the freshers there last week, week before. Oh. Um, it was a very, very, it's a very cool event. Um, I think you can see highlights on YouTube if that compensates in any way. Um, but basically it's just us showcasing all the sports and activity groups that we've got on in societies. We even have some commercial people that come in uh, there on the day. But if you're here for longer than a year, I, I strongly recommend you go to the next one. There's a lot of uh, freebies, uh, namely Domino's and uh, Uber Eats vouchers. Um, so yeah, sports, um, we have a lot of sports that happen at KCSU, um, be it, so the sports are centrally run by us, unless you're an elite performance um, athlete, um, which I'm sure some of you might be. Um, so it, it can range from, in terms of competitiveness, it can range from just being a social sport all the way up to being competitive uh, on a national or a regional level. So I personally play football um, and for us we compete on a regional level. Uh, it's, it's up to you really how far you want to go in terms of climbing that competitive ladder uh, to play a sport. And we do have a lot of sports. I think recently as well we've just started to have disabled sports as well. So I think last year we started to run uh, we wheelchair basketball and you can check online uh, for all of this uh, as well. Uh, Macadam Cup, so as, as well as the regional um, competition, we also do competition within ourselves. So we actually have uh, a cup every year which happens, which is Macadam, um, and it's all sports basically between medics and the rest of the university. Um, so the medics actually have our own team, which is GKT, um, but we welcome anyone really who wants to join us because we are a superior team to the KCL team. Um, and annually, except last year, we thrash them. Um, but yeah, that's just an example of some of the things that goes on. Um, this Girl Can is a campaign um, which is run to basically increase um, participation of women in sport and it um, reaches out to all sorts of different sports programs within the university and it's, re it's a really great time of year. I forgot what time of year it is but do check online um, when this is happening because you do get 
to um, be involved as a, if you're a self-defining woman, you can be involved um, within sports for free and you get free gym membership and other cool things like that. Um, so yeah, it definitely pays off to, to check that one out. Varsity is a much larger competition um, where it's basically us as a university um, against UCL, our major rivals, um, and that happens uh, every year, and I think around February, March time, just before exams peaks. Um, so yeah, if you are in, in, interested in sport and want to play to that level, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, in terms of volunteering or fundraising, that's another thing that we offer at KCSU, so if you ever wanted to volunteer for whatever cause it is, um, you could just hit us up. Um, on the website and send through a request for whatever, it, whatever cause you feel passionately about or you want to uh, raise funds for, we can allow you to do that. Um, I don't know if you guys, I, I'll talk about the space here, the new space at KCAT, at Denmark Hill in, in the RPPM building which um, houses the KCSU space here for the first time, um, just opened two weeks ago. Um, and yeah, you can, you can do that here in this space, you can do it in other campuses as well, you could do it um, outside if you wanted to, you just have to contact us to engage with us about how you want to do that fundraising and volunteering. If you want to fundraise and volunteer with a specific group, so certain societies, um, I don't know, like religious groups or the Christian Union or the Islamic Society, they can sometimes uh, run a lot of charity work. <coughs> And they're huge pieces of charity work, like I remember the Islamic Society, in a week somehow they managed to raise £100,000 um, in, in a large week of many, many events, which includes so many people, different faiths, different backgrounds. So it's something really um, for you to get involved and understand different cultures and faiths really, so it's um, really, really cool. Um, and yeah, Raising Money does have its perks. We have our Doggy De-Stress, and I think I've managed to convince them to actually bring Doggy De-Stress to Denmark Hill. Uh, that's going to happen, I think, during all being week, which we touched upon just earlier. So hopefully, I can see a lot of smiles in the room now. <laughs> so yeah, the Doggy De-Stress should be coming to Denmark Hill, um, and it'll be in the SU space, and yeah, watch this space about the dates. Liberation networks, um, so student communities made up of individuals, groups, societies and clubs who aim to combat oppression, discrimination and equality faced by some students. Um, and yeah, they're just a way for us to connect really and if you define as a certain characteristic, characteristic um, so there's a first generation network, there's a widely participation network, I think there's one for parents as well, there's one for LGBTQ plus communities um, and, and, uh, and, and BME students or people of colour. Um, so if you feel like you define with any of those groups, please do speak to them. Um, you probably face a lot of similar challenges to them. Um, so it would be really good for you to get in touch with them and understand about the work they do um, fighting all sorts of inequality on campus. We also run new development campaigns. We do a lot of things, actually. Um, so this is another thing where basically, um, if you do feel very passionately about a cause on campus or beyond, um, even though that can technically not be a campaign, but so that's another thing you don't have to worry about. Um, it's, it's something that we do. Um, so I think this is us. Actually, I can't remember what this was. But it, it, we've, we've, we've been there for a lot of protests, whether it's against certain political um, Th things that have happened um, or any things that you want to change on campus so even if it's something as little as I don't know having a vending machine somewhere um, you can do that you can just submit the idea to us and uh, it will go through a process and eventually through that process um, it will become a, a campaign which is backed by us so you get money for it you can go out there and say I want a vending machine there um, and <laughs> that, will, that will help uh, take your idea forward um, Yes, yeah, so student leaders, like I talked about earlier with uh, regards to the, the student officers that we elect every year, there are six major leaders, however we do also have other, other part-time officers um, and uh, trustees as well. There's a lot of positions, you could even become an academic rep if you wanted to, and those elections for those uh, are actually out now. So if you want to nominate yourself online to become an academic rep for your course, um, I'm not sure what courses you guys are on, but they told me you're postgraduate research students, so it's probably, you probably will be an academic rep for something. Um, and yeah, you can get to make a real difference. I think a lot of people come to university um, and leave with just a piece of paper and try not to do that. Try, SU is the King's College Long Students Union is the way that you could do something else alongside of that, whether it's the sports, whether it's the, the societies, whether it's the volunteering, even if you want to represent your people, the people in your course, to bring, to make an impact, to make, to make a change uh, for the better of, and the future of that course, um, please do that because then at least I don't know, for me at least, you, you get a sense of fulfillment that you've done something other than study really hard and come out with a decent grade at home. Um, so yeah, become an academic rep, uh, they build a community facilitating discussions between your classmates and the staff, um, and yeah, developing ideas, solutions, giving your experience, giving your ideas, um, and the cohorts, and basically channeling that towards the staff. And you'll be trained by us, supported by us, and um, you'll be building a stronger community in your classrooms. 
um, student media groups. Unfortunately, we don't have student media spaces here. However, in Bush House, uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Bush House, it's a beautiful space that we've got at King's. And the Students' Union has three floors there, packed out full of loads of cool things that you can do. If you join a student media group, you could use the radio suite there. It looks literally like walking into BBC Radio 1 Extra. It's kitted out with everything that you need um, to record. Um, there's a, also a photography suite, a video editing suite, um, with a green screen as well. So if you ever want to do any cool recordings, you can do that. Um, we've also got our uh, more sort of journalist stuff, so Strand Magazine and I think Raw News as well, and that's um, our uh, magazine and newspaper uh, run by students. We've also got venues, um, not at Denmark Hill, sadly, um, because the university didn't agree with that, but we're at Bush House and Guys, and not at Waterloo. Bush House and Guys, we've got uh, many things. Nort is our most brand new shop, which is at the end. It's actually a really cool shop, I think you should all check it out at Guys Campus. It's a sustainable shop which sells um, all sorts of things from like beans, spices, rice, bread. We don't actually sell anything in, in plastic cups or, or plastic containers, you bring your own um, jar, container, and then we weigh it and then give it to you like that. So it's just a very like, cool, natural shop which sells all sorts of things, <laughs> even soaps and tissues, so yeah, uh, get involved. Um, and the union shop which sells all the case your merchandise, Shack Vault, Guys Bar, The Shed, um, they're all out of food and drink outlets. Um, and yeah, that's the shop as well. And that's the case your merchandise, some of our lovely student models. <laughs> And this is the website, so the website is really cool. Um, we've just renovated it, I think, last year after a lot of pushing from me two years ago. Um, they managed to renovate it after a lot of money being invested. And it gives you everything that you ever need to know. If you literally just went into the search bar at the top and typed in whatever you're interested in, it will hit you with everything that has to do with that word. Does that make sense? It's basically Google on case it is. Um, and yeah, um, you can find everything I've just said on there. And you can buy memberships for whatever you wanted to buy a membership for, whether it's a sports club, a society, a network, um, you can do that via this, uh, via, via KCSU website. Uh, KCSU events, we obviously run events, so on the website actually, if you just went to events at the top and clicked all events, it will just give you all the events that are run, whatever campus you're at, um, and you can just have a look there, there's not really much more to say around that. That's just telling you you can do a lot of cool stuff in London. Um, <laughs> And yeah, obviously London is expensive. We do have a, a totem card. I don't know if you know about NUS Extra beforehand. It used to be NUS Extra. Now it's rebranded really as Totem. Um, I'll explain a little bit about it. So basically what it is, um, you get discounts everywhere. It is, I, I know people probably say, why, why should I buy, pay money for this? When uni days and like student beans is free, it actually gives you discounts on campus, not at Denmark Hill. It gives you discounts at Bush House and Guys and all of our outlets and the sustainable shop with all the cool beans and stuff. It gives you discounts there of at least 10% to 20%. Um, so it's worth doing it. You also get on the back of it an international student ID card. I used it last year in Egypt, in Bali, in Berlin, and I've managed to get this like at least half price on museums, tours, stuff like that. So um, it's definitely worth it. By the time you've used it, especially at places that maybe uni days and student beans don't give it to you, you kind of would have got your money back and your, and your money's worth for it. Are you all here for longer than a year? Yeah. Okay, I was going to try to sell it. Uh, buy the three years because you're not going to be a student for, for more than a year. Um, but if you wanted to buy it even towards the end of your course, buy the three year one when you're finishing and it will still continue on as a student discount card. <laughs> um, Cool. And that's where our spaces are. I work for hubs, so I'm a supervisor at KCSU Hubs. Um, and we actually give employment to students on campus. So if you actually were interested to do my job, sit on a desk, come and give talks to all of you lovely people at all of these, all of these uh, inductions. Um, yeah, we do, we do employ. Um, and you can just go on the website again and just, I think it's under Get Involved, work with us. And then there you can find student jobs. Um, even if you wanted to work at the bars or the, sh the cafeterias at Cape App guys or or push house and not the market hill. Um, you could do that. But if you wanted to work my job on desk, um, I think it will come out around January time. You're here for a couple of years. So I think it's probably worth making some decent money. And we pay London living wage, which is £10.55 an hour, better than most retailers. Um, yeah, H and M or other places would have paid as well. Um, this is a new space that we've got. I hope I'm not running out of time. Uh, this is a new space that we've got around the corner. So if you just turned out right here into the courtyard and you walked across, the door is actually not working. They forgot to put a handle on the door, so you just have to, at the moment, knock, and I'll come down and open it for you. Um, but it's something that we're looking to fix. Um, 
And yeah, there's another entrance as well, I think, if you just went through the main IOP reception, went up one floor, turned left, past the chapel, so you keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, and then you'll just see a big glass area, and that's, that's where we're based. And uh, we're open most days from around 10 a.m. until 9 p.m. Um, and yeah, you're more than welcome to come there. We've got microwave, water dispensers, um, if you just want to chill, like it's a social space, that's why it's, it's, it's there for you to do. You could also book out half the space as well if you wanted to, to do an activity. So we've actually designed the flooring for it to be feasible for you guys to do any activities you wanted to do. If you wanted to book it out for uh, maybe a screening, for whatever, um, we've got all of that available for you to do there as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff for you to go do in that space. Um, I'd recommend checking it out. And yeah, contact us, like I said, contact maybe these student officers as well because they are our elected um, student leaders for the year and um, their aims and objectives might align with yours. You might want to um, talk to them about anything you have. And if you actually have a complaint to make um, about your course, which I'm sure you won't, um, you could contact whoever the relevant person is out of this list. And I believe that is it. We look forward to having you as part of our union, which you're already a part, uh, a part of. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions for me, I'm on the desk until 8 o'clock. I'm more than happy to talk to you guys on a personal note or in a professional capacity about anything that's all to do with King's KCSU. Um, I'm very honest, so I'll tell you. How about it? Any questions? All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard a lot about uh, King so far and uh, KCSU, and I'd like to echo uh, what was just said on KCSU. Like, reach out to them. They will help you uh, establish new communities, things like that. And uh, I think uh, we, I'm talking for me as uh, president of the new Denmark Hill Postgraduate Research Student Association, uh, have recently, like two weeks ago, been granted official status of association. We felt very strongly like there's a lot of things out there for King students, but a lot of it is based at Strand and Guides Club campus. And it's, it's really great, but it's just not always feasible as a PhD student to keep traveling up and down because we do have, you know, quite long work days. So um, we have now been, we, we, we are aiming actually to set up the network here, a platform for all PhD students from KCL uh, and also postgraduate research students, other uh, young researchers that can join us for free. Uh, we want to have a network here that has social events, weekly social events, all the keynote speakers and career perspective things. We have events such as uh, bicycle rides, go on walks. These are my two wonderful colleagues, Claire and Druti. This is where it all started a year ago on a, on a trip to the Peak District. And uh, well, if you want to uh, find out more, join us. Uh, we're open to all King's College London PhD students or postgraduate research students. And uh, we host all our events based on Denmark Hill. So the new KCLSU space, I don't know if you've seen it, you should see it, it's going to be good. On the 1st of November, we'll have our opening event. You can sign up, come for free, have some food, have some drinks, meet everyone, and let's build a, a cracking community here with lots of students that want to have some, some fun outside of their PhD as well. And uh, yeah, I'll keep it short because you're probably super tired as well. And uh, yeah, so come meet me upstairs with, uh, with Claire as well, I think. And uh, let's have a chat. Cheers.